Good evening. Welcome to the last um, event of the year at First Thursdays at the Marin County Law Library. We're pleased tonight to have a team of professionals join us um, from the Public Guardian's Office, Public Conservator for the County of Marin. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to do a brief recap of this year. We began this program back in January with a visit from the then um, representatives from the current uh, grand jury here in Marin. Their reports have since been released, and it's worth taking another look at the interview that we had with them back in January. We've had the incredible good fortune to have a number of individuals and representatives from our health and human services team, and we want to let folks know how much we appreciate their generosity of time and spirit. Tonight, we're joined by Mark Vanderskoff, who currently serves as the public guardian, public conservative for the County of Marin. He's joined by several of the professionals he works with, Erica and Karen, and I will invite all of them to give a brief introduction and tell, them, tell us what they do. Um, these are the folks that are dedicated to promoting the health, safety, and quality of life for conserved adults in Marin unable to manage their own medical, personal, and or financial matters. He comes to us after completing the UC Berkeley Bay Area Social Services Executive Development Program and currently serves as the chair of the Marin County Financial Abuse Specialist Team. He has collaborated greatly in private and public sectors and has had management positions with Buckaloo Programs and the Marin County Adult Protective Services. We are lucky to have him tonight to talk about what his department does to offer the community a chance to ask questions about it. And we'd like to acknowledge the fact that these three generous folks are giving up time from family and friends here in the middle of the holiday season. We appreciate their collaboration here with the law library. As was pointed out, we are in fact next door neighbors. May I invite anyone that is interested in taking a look at some of the previous interviews that we've done, go to YouTube, look up the Marin County Law Library, and this interview will actually be, be added within the next week, and we appreciate the continuing interest in this program. I'd like to now turn this over to Mark, Erica, and Karen, and to thank our law librarian, Stephen Richards, for all that he does to make this and all of the programs at the Marin County Law Library as excellent as they are. We are definitely being served with a gifted staff, and we'd like to acknowledge them and the hard work that they perform every day. Stephen, happy almost second anniversary. We appreciate having you. Mark, thank you very much, and it's all yours. All right, thank you, Denise. Thank you for that nice, warm introduction. So yes, my name is Mark Vanderstoff. Uh, as Denise said, I'm the current um, public guardian, public conservator for Marin County. I've been with uh, Health and Human Services at the county for about 17 years, uh, mostly in the public guardian's office, but also with Adult Protective Services. And then, as Denise mentioned before that, I work in the community with Buckaloo programs, providing residential treatment for mentally ill adults. So I've always had an interest in uh, helping out older adults and mentally ill adults. I'm going to turn it over to Erica from my office to introduce herself. And then we'll get started and go through the PowerPoint. And Karen, uh, after Erica introduces herself, why don't you introduce yourself? Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. I am Erica Blangino, and I'm the supervising deputy here at Marin County Public Guardian's office. I've been with our office about eight years, um, started as a deputy public guardian, then a lead deputy, and here I am now as supervising deputy. Um, I've been working in health and human services and various social work positions for about 11 years now. And yeah, we're very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting us. And we're looking forward to talking about conservatorships and what they can accomplish. Hi, I'm Karen Lee. <clears throat> I'm the office assistant at the Public Guardian's office. Uh, I came from the corporate and university world before joining the Public Guardian office. 
um, about three years ago now, and I'm in charge of reporting, assisting, purchasing, kind of all the back end stuff. Um, I'm generally just trying to keep our wonderful deputies who are kind of the front lines with our conservatees and of course, keeping Mark, keeping Mark and Erica happy. <laughs> so if you need anything from me, feel free to direct chat with me uh, while we're on this. All right, thanks, Karen. Well, why don't we start the slideshow? So next slide, please. So what does the Public Guardian's Office do? Well, you're gonna be learning that tonight. First of all, as, as Denise mentioned, um, basically we function as the court appointed conservator for those adults in Marin who have been deemed incapable of handling their own affairs. So there are two different kinds of conservatorships that we'll be telling you about. There's the LPS, also known as mental health conservatorship. There's also a probate conservatorship and we can be appointed conservator of the person or of the estate or both. Uh, our office also provides representative payee services. We can be appointed by the Social Security Administration uh, to administer someone's benefits. We do this as someone is referred to us by Marin County uh, Behavioral Health. The idea is if we're um, taking care of someone's benefits and making sure that their rent's being paid, and that they can provide for their food, clothing, and our shelter, hopefully they will stay off the path to conservatorship. So next slide, please. So just a lot of you are probably familiar with conservatorships, especially a couple of years ago. There was a lot of press about conservatorship. It was free Brittany, you know, Brittany's father had been appointed her private conservator. Uh, she was unhappy with, with the way things were going. And that was played out in the press. Uh, also that year, there was a movie that came out called I Care A Lot. Uh, and it was about a, again, private conservator fiduciary who basically mistreated her conservatees. The story, which was fictional, revolved around, um, she took over the affairs of an older woman. She sold her home without letting her know. She sold her belongings without letting her know. And then she threw her in a nursing home and, and wouldn't let her out. So this is not behavior that we want to condone. And in this state, that's actually impossible because private, private fiduciaries and public guardians uh, are overseen by the superior court. So for example, if we're in county, if we are conserving someone, we need to submit an inventory of all of their assets. We need to list those, give those to the court so that the court's aware of what the person has. Uh, if we want to make a major decision on behalf of the conservatee, such as selling their house, we again first need to tell the conservatee, then we need to let the court know and ask the court's permission to do so. Even if it's something smaller, like right now we're seeking court approval to sell a few thousand dollars worth of baseball cards, um, but we, we need to be and, and want to be as transparent as possible. Also, public guardian has to place people in the least restrictive option for placement. Uh, we can't put people in a nursing home unless medically or psychiatrically they need to be there. Um, we have to give our conservatees spending money. We have to allow them access to a phone. We have to allow them visitors. Um, so, you know, what was depicted in the movie is, is not accurate here. Uh, and maybe most importantly is we have to do an accounting of everything that comes into the account and everything that goes out of the account. Uh, after we're appointed conservator, and then every two years thereafter. So let's go to the next slide. So the other side of the coin is right now, conservatorship is, is a lot in the news as being the answer to a lot of society's problems. Um, conservatorship can perhaps end homelessness, uh, cure the substance use uh, epidemic. And if we conserve more people, um, then this may be the answer to some of society's problems. So while it's true that conservatorship is very beneficial and helpful, we would need to make sure that we have the services and facilities in place uh, in order to serve people um, in the most efficacious manner. So let's go to the next slide. So every county in the state has a public administrator, public guardian, public conservator. Uh, in this county, we are in the social services division. Other counties, we might be in behavioral health or we might be in aging and adults. 
uh, as it says on the slide, our responsibilities are defined statutorily. So we have to act according to the probate code and the welfare and institutions code. As I've already mentioned, we're overseen by the superior court. We get audited by social security to make sure that we're utilizing people's benefits correctly. Uh, and we, we are, as I say, a, a public facing organization in terms of our transparency. I like to think of the work of a, of a deputy public guardian or all of us actually as kind of a mixture of law and social work and accounting. It's a very unique field. Um, so let's go to the next slide. There's our nice civic center. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a brief history lesson on LPS conservatorships. Uh, back in 1967, Landerman Petrus Short, hence the LPS, sought to end the inappropriate, indefinite, and involuntary commitment of persons with mental health disorders. So what was going back on back then was that there was no community mental health treatment. So if someone was mentally ill, they could be remanded to the state hospitals, often for life, with very little fanfare. Uh, judges could spend and did spend just four to five minutes on cases at times before telling someone to go to the state hospital. So there was no due process. There were no protections for the people that were you know, going to be sent off to the state hospitals. At the peak of that population, uh, which was in 1959, 37,000 people were housed in the state hospitals. So they weren't equipped to handle this number. Uh, people weren't well cared for. And this, this became a legislative uh, focus in, in the 60s, which was great. So. Um, I'll tell you what, what those safeguards that were put in place then uh, were in a couple of minutes, but th this was a great act. The thing that it didn't do, though, was as the state hospitals were being emptied out, people were being sent back to the counties that they came from, but there was no funding given to the counties to be the safety net for these people. So the last 50 years, counties have been you know, putting a robust service pro delivery program together. Um, but that would have been great if that would have been funded from the beginning. So uh, LPS has remained in place unchanged up until like this year, this year and last year. And I'll, I'll tell you about a, a few initiatives in a minute that, have, that are changing it. So let's go to the next slide. So just I'll try and be brief here. So the traditional path to LPS conservatorships, it's very difficult to get on a mental health conservatorship. Uh, Generally, somebody it starts off with someone being put on a 5150, which is a psychiatric hold for three days. Uh, this is instituted by law enforcement or a clinician. Uh, if someone is deemed or suspected of being gravely disabled due to a mental illness and un unable to provide for their food, clothing, and or shelter. If they are not stabilized in 72 hours, they can be put on a 14-day hold at a short-term psychiatric facility. Uh, that's called a 5250. If a psychiatrist feels that they are gravely disabled still at that point, they can either be referred to our office or they can be put on another 30-day hold, which is a 5270, for the hospitals to work with them and hopefully avoid the conservatorship. And then recently this year, another 30 days was added to that. Uh, that the hospitals can keep people uh, to stabilize them. So the total number of days right now that someone can be hospitalized is 77. Um, but there are a number of exit points, as I'll point out, uh, during those 77 days. Uh, when the case does, if the case does get to our office, then our deputy public guardians investigate the case. We interview the client, the family, the clinicians, look at the mental health records. Uh, then in 30 days, we're going to go to court and we're going to say we either think the person needs to be put on the LPS conservatorship or we're going to say we think it should be dismissed um, because they are able to provide for their basic necessities. Or we have a third option, which is we can continue it out. Uh, we can continue it out for as long as six months, uh, which we would sometimes do with the goal of if the person is in housing and taking their medications, maybe then they won't need to continue on the conservatorship. So at the end of the temporary conservatorship period, uh, there is a hearing. If we are going forward and the conservatorship is granted, we the conservatorship is in effect for one year. At the end of that period of time, uh, if we do want to renew the conservatorship, 
we have to have two doctors, two psychiatrists opinions stating that the person is still gravely disabled. So what LPS did, which again, I think is great, is that there are a number of exit points throughout this whole circle or semicircle here. People can challenge all of the psychiatric holds. They can challenge the temporary conservatorship. They can challenge the imposition of the um, regular LPS conservatorship. They can file writs, they can go to court. Um, so it's, it's a very, it's, it's a process in which people have a lot of rights, which, which, I, which is good. Um, so I think we can go on to the next slide. Uh, so what happens if we do get conservatorship? Well, the public guardian would then have the ability to place someone in a locked psychiatric setting. We can place in any setting. It might be in the community, uh, but it might also be in a locked psychiatric setting. Depends on the needs of the person psychiatrically, and we work with behavioral health to, de to determine those needs. We also have the ability to administer medications. What that means is if someone isn't taking their medications and clinicians are recommending this, we would have the, author the authority to administer Medicaid, approve the administration of medications involuntarily. Uh, generally, we're also going to be able to consent to routine medical procedures like COVID vaccines, flu shots, that kind of thing. Uh, generally, while on the LPS, people are not able to operate a motor vehicle. They cannot enter into contracts of more than $40. And of course, they cannot be allowed to possess firearms. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. So I'm going to briefly talk about three changes to the LPS laws, and then we'll go on to talk more about uh, the probate conservatorships. But you may, I'm sure you've all heard perhaps of the CARE Court, Community Assistance Recovery and Empowerment Court. Governor Newsom signed that into law. So what this does is this provides a new court uh, and possibly a new way towards conservatorship for people. There, a broad array of people can refer individuals into this court. It could be a family member, it could be a friend, it could be a clinician. Uh, they're referred to the court, and then if they are assessed as being eligible for the care court, uh, then they would be put on a treatment plan, which everyone would agree to. They need to go back to court frequently to report on how the treatment plan is going. But if during that period of time, the person doesn't want to cooperate with the treatment plan, you know, they leave treatment, they refuse treatment, there's an option for judges to refer to the public guardian office for conservatorship. So this would be a new client base for us. These people are not in the hospital. These are people in the community. So this could increase the number of people that are referred for conservatorship by quite a bit. Um, Right now, seven counties have adopted the uh, care court, eight actually, because Los Angeles just, just did as well. Um, the rest of the counties, including Marin, are going to adopt it December 1st, uh, 2024. So we're going to be looking at the eight counties that are using the care court in the next year to see what their experiences are, uh, what best practices we can learn from them, uh, and, and go from there. And we'll be working with behavioral health as well. All right, so next slide, Senate Bill 317. This is another uh, legislative bill that has been signed into law last year. So what this bill does is it allows the criminal court uh, to refer to the public guardian office, which again is, is new. So these are individuals that are in the jail. Uh, they've committed misdemeanors. Uh, they're deemed incompetent to stand trial because of a mental illness. Uh, they are thought to be gravely disabled, unable to provide for their food, clothing, and or shelter. And they're not eligible for diversion. Uh, so if, if these conditions are met, the criminal court can refer to the public guardian office to initiate conservatorship investigation. And the criminal court is doing this. Um, in the last fiscal year, actually 44% of our LPS referrals came from the criminal court. So this is just uh, a huge influx um, of, of new conservatees uh, coming into our system that before we would not have really um, had any communication with, with people that were in jail. So let's go on to the next one, which is Senate Bill 43. That was just signed into law very, very recently. 
and this is maybe the most sweeping of all of them. So this redefines the definition of grave disability. So it adds substance use as a qualifying diagnosis for conservatorship, which would be huge. To date, substance use is, is not a, a reason to um, put someone on an LPS conservatorship. So this would open the door to a whole new population. There aren't really, if there are any, it would be very few locked substance use uh, facilities. So it would be difficult to place these people. Um, there are also a lot of new definitions like unable to attend a person or to necessary personal or medical care. These kinds of vaguer definitions would open the door to maybe a lot more people coming in um, and being referred to my office for uh, conservatorship investigation. So let's go on to the next slide. So these are all really good initiatives and they're all motivated, um, you know, with people wanting to help individuals that they see on the streets, you know, that maybe are mentally ill or maybe they're having substance use issues. So they want to help people um, just like LPS did, you know, 50 years ago. Uh, but we just need to make sure that we have enough beds um, to help all of this new population that would be coming our way. Because right now it is actually difficult to find apartments and facilities for mentally ill adults. Um, Oftentimes, there's a waiting list for our current conservatees. So if we're expanding you know, the definition of LPS and getting a lot more people in here, particularly people that have a criminal history, um, then those people are also difficult to place anyway. So while, while it's really, an, it, it is a really interesting time um, for LPS law, uh, so we'll just be seeing what how this unfolds over the next couple of years. We'll be working with behavioral health and um, seeing how it all plays out. Uh, I'm part of a task force that's going to be looking at the care cord and how it's being rolled out in the other counties. So I think that will be it for my um, LPS discussion. Uh, I think we can go to the next slide and I will turn it over to Erica. All right, thank you. Uh, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about probate conservatorships, which is the second type of conservatorship our office offers. Karen, can you go to the next slide, please? So unlike LPS conservatorships, which are considered on a yearly basis, uh, once a probate conservatorship is appointed, it's typically for life. Probate conservatorships are for people who are substantially unable to provide for their physical health, food, clothing, or shelter, or substantially unable to manage their financial resources. So typically what that means, um, there are people who've been diagnosed with major neurocognitive disorders that are not expected to improve. So some examples of that might be um, people who are born with developmental delays, people who have suffered traumatic brain injuries, um, or maybe somebody who has developed dementia. Another important criteria is all probate conservatees have been assessed by a doctor to lack capacity to make decisions in their own best interest. So the, the probate code is very clear on two points. Just because somebody has a qualifying diagnosis does not mean that they qualify for conservatorship. Instead, there must be a demonstrated pattern of unsafe incidents or self-neglecting behavior. So the substantial inability to provide um, is defined by the code to not be a single incident or just a couple incidents um, of self-neglect or bad luck or poor decision making. Instead, it has to be an ongoing pattern showing the need for an intervention, along with that lack of capacity due to a qualifying diagnosis. The second point um, the code makes is alternatives to conservatorship must be considered. Not only what alternatives can be considered, but we have to explain why those alternatives are not viable solutions for the proposed conservatee. So what are we talking about when we talk about alternatives to conservatorship? It, it really just depends on the circumstances of each unique referral. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. 
So generally when our office gets a call regarding a potential conservatorship, our first question is which social service agencies are involved in working with the clients. So connecting the proposed conservatee to APS or the ombudsman or other case management programs like maybe Kaiser Care at Home, um, that is really the first step. Um, these agencies can connect the proposed conservatee to all sorts of resources and connection, and that could be anything from Meals on Wheels to in-home supportive services, um, maybe signing them up for Medi-Cal, maybe connecting them with a healthcare team. Um, the goal is always to resolve whatever health and safety concerns there are using community resources. Conservatorship should always be considered as the very last option. Um, so perhaps the concern is around medical decision making. Um, for example, maybe the proposed conservatee needs a medical procedure, but there's some concerns that they may lack capacity. Um, again, our first step is considering, you know, can that concern be resolved without imposing a conservatorship, which would unnecessarily limit their, their rights and freedoms. Uh, so depending on the circumstances, uh, some medical decision making issues can be resolved with advanced healthcare directives, maybe a medical ethics team. Um, there's various health and safety codes which also address this. Uh, if the issue is one of financial concern, you know, perhaps the proposed conservatee would benefit um, and that would, you know, be a representative payee that would redirect income, uh, create a budget, pay the proposed conservatee's bills for them. Um, or maybe the proposed conservatee just needs assistance in setting their income up to be a direct deposit and their bills on auto pay. Um, each situation is, you know, very unique. Uh, some other things we might be looking at are estate planning documents, um, or perhaps there's a private fiduciary who may be involved. So, you know, not only is our office considering alternatives to conservatorship, but as we'll see on the next slide, we also have to consider alternatives to our office itself. Go to the next slide, please, Karen. Uh, so the code is uh, very clear on the order of preference for the appointment of a probate conservator. So as you may recall, all conservatees have been assessed to lack capacity. However, the, the first person that the court would consider is anyone nominated by the proposed conservatee when they had capacity. So if the proposed conservatee left written instructions regarding who they wanted their, their decision maker to be, that would be the ideal person. If they left no written instructions, uh, then it would go through this order. Uh, as long as all people were considered appropriate and able and willing to act. So it would first be the spouse or the person nominated by the spouse, then an adult child or the person nominated by the child, then a parent or a sibling or the person's nominated by them. Uh, next, you'll see any other person or entity who is qualified and able to act. So that may be a very close friend, that may be a private fiduciary, depending on the size of the estate. Uh, and then finally, at the end, you'll see the public guardian uh, is the last to act if no other person is able or willing to. So as you can see, you know, all options should be explored prior to the public guardian's consideration as conservator. The public guardian really is the agency of last resort when all else has been tried and failed um, and there's no one else to move forward. Our office would be the one to. Uh, Karen, next slide. So what does a probate referral look like? Uh, typically they are coming from adult protective services, medical hospitals, or skilled nursing facilities. The basis of all referrals is a doctor's assessment of incapacity. Uh, the referral should really be explaining, you know, the diagnosis, the prognosis, what is going on, you know, essentially why that referring party believes that a conservatorship is necessary. Our investigation would be looking at the allegations made in the referral. Um, we would be considering, you know, does this person meet the criteria for a probate conservatorship? And again, we would be looking at those alternatives, not only to conservatorship, but also to our own office's appointment. If we decided that it was appropriate and there is no other, you know, intervention available to that proposed conservatee, our office would move forward. Um, 
right now it takes about four months from the filing of a petition to get a hearing date for a probate appointment. So it is not a quick process. Uh, the proposed conservatee is going to be assigned an attorney. It's typically the public defender, but not always. Uh, and the public, or excuse me, the proposed conservatee always has the right to contest their conservatorship. Um, as you can imagine, you know, most people are not wanting to be conserved. Uh, as part of the process, the court is going to assign somebody named a court investigator to go out and their job is to review records, to interview the proposed conservatee, the referring party, and essentially put together a neutral third party recommendation as to if the conservatorship is necessary, and if so, who they believe is the most appropriate person to be appointed as conservator. Uh, and then ultimately, it's really up to the judge. The judge could appoint a conservator uh, with all powers requested, they could appoint a conservator with half of the powers requested, or they could deny the petition altogether. Uh, next slide. Uh, if appointed, the probate conservator can have pretty sweeping powers. Uh, they may be granted the power to place the conservatee in the least restrictive level of care available to that conservatee. So that could be to remain in their own home with extra support. That could be, you know, to be placed in boarding care, maybe a skilled nursing facility. And again, that is all done um, depending on the conservatee's individual needs um, and with oversight from the court. Uh, the conservator can also make medical decisions on behalf of the conservatee. They may be granted the authority to authorize care for the treatment of dementia, which might include placement in specialized facilities or specialized medications. Uh, and finally, the conservator may be authorized to make financial decisions on behalf of the conservatee. So that's anything from collecting and redirecting income to be used on behalf of the conservatee, to um, marshalling assets, um, safeguarding them, or perhaps selling them, depending on the conservatee's needs. Uh, next slide. So as Mark had mentioned, there have been many changes and many competing ideas around conservatorships in California. So most recently on the probate side, we've seen Bill 280. Um, it's a new bill that requires each county superior court to collect a written plan from the new conservator, outlining the care and treatment and financial planning of the conservatee. So this is something that Marin has done for years. So it's, it's nothing new to us, um, but it is a new standard that they set across the state. Uh, and then also a very exciting new development for us, the state has created a new position called the State Public Guardian Liaison. Um, and she's been interviewing each public guardian throughout the state and collecting data on what challenges we're running into, um, what re resources we have, what best practices she's seeing. And she's gonna be putting all of this together, sharing this information um, across the state with all the PGOs um, and also with her own Department of Aging Leadership. And the goal is to improve services and client outcomes. It's really exciting that the state has created this position and you know, we're hopeful that it's going to help better understand barriers, um, share resources, you know, best practices and really improve client care and outcomes. Well, next slide. So our office is always open for questions or consultations. Uh, you can reach us Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 4.30. Our number is listed here. It's 415-473-2870. Uh, we've also included some helpful numbers of our partnering agencies, including APS and BHRS. And so that's that's the end of our presentation. You know, we, we thank you for having us, and we hope this has been an interesting and helpful one for you. We thank you very much. Um, at this point, are there any additional questions for, for our speakers tonight? Uh, yes, go ahead. Do we have to unmute them or? No, okay. go ahead, Denise.
Oh, I'm sorry. You know, maybe you can put your question in the chat and we can try it that way. Yeah. Um, but in the meantime, Carol? How common is it for uh, someone outside the family to charge a fee to be a conservator? Is that anything that happens? Yeah, so I can speak a little bit to how probate fees are charged. Um, so the fee for Marin Public um, Guardian is $100 an hour. Um, however, that fee is often deferred if the client doesn't have sufficient funds. Um, we would just perform the normal services as, as needed. Um, also, all fees are always you know, they always go through the court first. So no conservator in California is able to just take fees from their conservatees. Rather, they have to petition for fees. The judge would review those fees, determine if they were appropriate or not. The judge would be looking at, you know, is that a reasonable amount of fees to charge for the services provided? And then also be looking at the health of the estate. So um, typically you're not gonna be seeing a judge approve half of somebody's funds or a quarter of somebody's um, savings for fees. So hopefully that helps answer your question. I can't really speak to other private fiduciaries, but that is how the fee structure works um, for our office. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then somebody online, or sorry, via the phone has their hand up. They can go ahead. Hi, I, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much for coming. And um, I know that you have a very difficult job and thank you for what you're doing. Um, I uh, one, one comment I have is that the courts aren't giving a, uh, given enough funding to be able, uh, from what I've seen to you, be able to adequately um, oversee conservatorships. I mean, yes, they do, they have a process and such, but I don't see that there's enough staff to be able to um, adequately look at the finances and be able to understand what the conservators are doing. Um, so that's kind of problematic. I think a lot of problems may, um, may be, uh, Cause because from that, but also um, I would like to add that I I've uh, seen some problems with probate attorneys and their and uh, and also professional fiduciaries for what they're charging, and um, it doesn't seem to be uh, the staff just isn't able to be able to um, to look at that enough. Um, and it's terrible. I've seen a, a lot of that going on. I think there needs to be a huge, uh, a much larger focus on the on the probate attorneys. It seems that the bar association isn't able to properly um, to properly do oversight. There have been some articles and some. I guess the legislature is aware of this, and I see that happening in Marin also. So. Um, but you have a very difficult job from what I've seen. Um, and uh, one other, one other uh, comment I have is that, yes, actually, the Santa Clara Public Guardian, there was um, a, a big, a big um, to-do about that several years ago. Uh, KGO uh, TV went and investigated primetime news and everything. But, um, but you know, um, there are always ish, there are always reasons and problems, um, and I again um, I don't think it's an easy there's anything easy about it. And by the way, I'm a I've been a family care, um, conservator, and it lasted the conservatorship uh, lasted uh, over 12 years, so it's a lengthy amount of time, um, and it's not an easy process. I thank you for listening to me. And um, and for all you do, also. Well, thank you, thank you very much, and and you do raise a lot of good points. I would agree. Uh, the Superior Court needs more funding. They do have conservator investigator positions, but I think they only have a few of those. And of course, there are more conservatorships than that. Um, in terms of numbers, it's actually it's lower than you might think with the Marin County Public Guardian. 
for probate conservatees, we have what, between 35 and 40, Erica, um, which is pretty small, you know, when you think of the population of Marin County. Um, our LPS, our mental health conservatorships, we have about 105. Um, so those are, are fairly small as well. Um, but yes, there, there's problems with oversight uh, with the courts. Uh, and again, we just try and be as transparent as we can um, with what we're doing so that the courts can approve you know, our fees and that type of thing. But thank you. Do we have any more questions tonight? I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you once again for coming and speaking. We appreciate the opportunity for you to share the information, and especially on something that's been such a, a topic, especially here in California. Um, every organization, publication, Cal Matters, um, remarked that they found themselves in the middle of summer two years ago talking about conservatorships, which was the last thing they expected. But the fact that we have the ability to invite our local public officials to come and give us a better understanding of this, we appreciate you. And if there are no more questions, I'm going to wish everyone a good night and the happiest of holidays. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.